Good evening and welcome to MSD's March Animal Health Series. This is the first video of a four part series where we'll cover pre-breeding prep and why starting early matters. I'm Catherine Heffernan, working with MSD Livestock Intelligence as Customer and Technical Support Manager. We're here outside Tullamore, County Offaly on John Gill's farm and we're joined by Donald Lynch from Sleeve Bloom Veterinary and the farmer John Gill. So John, I suppose there's three generations of your family working on this farm um, here today, I suppose. And if you want to give us a bit of a background on that. My grandfather bought the farm in 1946 and then my father took over from him in the mid 60s. And I came home here in the late 90s. I'm farming here ever since. We're milking, we're heading towards 120 cows milking this year. Uh, we keep all replacements and we do some beef as well and we grow about 40 odd acres of tillage for our own use. Okay, and is, you use all that yourself on your own farm? Yeah, we do, yeah. Feeding that yeah, here. yeah. Very good, and you're uh, busy at this, this time of year calving? Yeah, we're kind of, well, we're more than two thirds of the way through it now, so it's easing off a little bit. It's starting to look out towards the fields, hopefully, <laughs> if they're not covered in snow. Okay, and have you the cows out day and night at the moment? Oh, or? no, no, they're just out for a few hours during the day. Okay, and you haven't been affected by the, the cold snap of weather here? Well, I held them back. Uh, they're still almost on their full indoor feed. They're just uh, maybe four kilos uh, of an allocation outdoors. I suppose we have the, the breeding season is uh, coming soon, seven weeks or eight weeks away. When do you actually start yourself? Towards the end of April, maybe the 23rd, 24th of April. Okay. And um, have you, do you want to give us a bit of an insight, I suppose, into you know, maybe what, what you've been doing in the past, what works for you, what... Yeah, I suppose we fairly simple program. We have split, we have autumn and spring calving, so we calve uh, roughly 30, 70 uh, autumn and spring. So the, the autumn ones hopefully are taken care of at this stage, and uh, the spring ones then we vaccinate. We vaccinate maybe two weeks pre-breeding with for leptospirosis, uh, IBR, and BVD, and uh, I also at that stage I give them two copper boluses as well, just to try and improve uh, conception a bit. And then I don't record pre-breeding uh, heats. I'd keep an eye on them and see what ones weren't, obviously, and estrus cows and that sort of thing. But uh, in general, I hit the ground uh, around towards the end of April and just AI at will. And Donal, I suppose in terms of vaccinations in getting ready for the breeding season or the likes of this anestrus, the anestrus cows and non-cycling cows, what's your approach and outlook at that at this stage? I know it's still a while off yet, but where would you kind of look at now? Well, I suppose John has mentioned the main vaccines we'd want to be looking at. And like, EFTA was endemic across all of Ireland. So I would say every dairy or suckler farmer should be vaccinating for lepto. IBR is also quite common. We should be using that. A lot of people are starting to question BVD. The BVD eradication program is quite well down the road now towards eradication. But still, there is a significant risk if you get BVD onto the farm. Even though the chances of getting it are quite low, the consequences of getting it are quite high. So I would say definitely all those three I would be vaccinating against. The other thing to bear in mind is don't forget salmonella, which John will be given back in September time. Um, not something we tend to think at this time of the year, but salmonella unfortunately has become more common, and especially as herds get bigger, that's something that you wouldn't want to forget to make sure that your salmonella vaccine has got in. Uh, the other thing John also mentioned was copper boluses. Depends on the part of the country you're in, but we are an awfully, I'd say, copper deficiency is a significant issue that we would want to be looking at and addressing on. Mm -hmm. And at what stage would you be kind of, do you feel is most important to be looking out for that kind of uh, deficiencies or when's best to go in do you think? Well, I suppose every farm is different okay so if you look at your vaccinations I would have always said with your vaccines that if you're going with BVD and Lepto we'll say it's two shots to the heifers one shot every year after that so I would be saying you're going in around Valentine's Day and Patrick's Day and then that ties in with starting breeding towards the end of April a month later okay they're two easy days to remember the IBR you have to fit in somewhere around them as well trying to keep a two week window between vaccinations. When do you start looking at cows? Well, sure, like, as farmers and vets, we're looking at cows all the time. Like, there's no, there's no time you're not looking at cows. When you want to hit the breeding season, what do we want? We want cows in good condition, healthy, not lame, comfortable and happy in what they're doing. 
but we also want them on a rising plane in nutrition. So we want them putting on condition when they go to grass and start the breeding season. That's a bit of a challenge. Like, you know, you mentioned talking to John about the cold snap. Trying to manage a diet as you're going to grass and, you know, we're all talking at the moment about bits of snow and this cold snap coming. It ain't going to be much good for grass growing. And then how do we keep our diet consistent as we get into the breeding season? So I think nutrition and how we manage that and how we manage body condition score is hugely important. But we're looking at that maybe across a herd. But if you come back and you have to look at the individual cows, like John, you're going to look at your cows individually. And like every farmer, you're going to have an odd lame cow or you're going to have a cow that maybe isn't in as good condition as you'd like. And they're the cows we're trying to pull out. So this time of the year, you're probably looking anything that's any way lame, you're trying to pull them out, lift their feet, check them, treat them as necessary. What would your protocol be on that kind of side of things, John, in terms of maybe, you know, uh, maybe thinner cows, older cows, lame cows? What's your protocol? Well, the lame cows, they treat them as soon as they see them. Uh, we do routinely foot bathe with um, copper sulphate. Uh, kind of once a month or if, you ha if they were out and you had poor weather maybe more often uh, you you'd see the skulls on the back of their feet and I'll start I'll foot bathe them straight away and I try and do any, any treat any lameness as quickly as possible because they're given the cows will average probably at peak maybe 32 35 kilos so they uh, won't tolerate sore feet they'll, they'll go back very very quickly. Nutrition is a massive part of this like we all know that but where once a day comes from is, we've all bred cows. John, what are your cows averaging now at peak? Well, autumn and spring, the spring ones would probably peak around 37, 38, but overall 32 or 33. Well, well, let's say we just look at the spring ones here because of the time of the year we're thinking of. And you think of a spring calf and cow, peak is six weeks after she calves, which is breeding season, turn out to grass, a lot of challenges coming to her. And it's fair hard to get enough energy into her to match that. So like if you start looking, like if, if we're looking and, and we talk about UFLs or units of energy, sure for 40 litres of milk, let's say, to put a round figure on it, we need 20 UFLs for milk and six or seven UFLs for walking around, which is 25 UFLs, which is basically 25 kilos of really good quality feed, be it 25 kilos of grass or a mixture of meal. And so not many cows are going to go out and eat. Like, what were you saying meal-wise you'd, you'd be feeding? Overall. At, let, let's say when we look at the time of the year at, at peak, it turned out to grass. Are you saying four kilos a meal? Oh, no, more, probably six. Six kilos in the parlour? In the parlour, and then another two in the TMR. So eight, eight, but even if we bring that back from the, the 25 and take eight off there, we're looking for 17 kilos of grass to get into them. And like, 17 kilos of grass, if you're down in the sunny southeast and the paddock is beside the yard and the weather conditions are perfect, that's achievable and maybe more. But it's a big challenge to do it at that time of the year. And I think maybe once a day fits in on that, particularly if we've cows that are yielding very well and struggling, we reduce the amount of milk they're producing, but we keep the energy going in. And that gets them onto the thing of cycling better and putting on a bit of condition, which I think hugely helps fertility. John, you said you'd be a bit nervous to do it. Would that be from a mastitis point yeah. of view? Yeah. 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 And, and that's, what do you that's think? a fair concern. Of is course it? that's a fair concern. But our experiences with it is that it, it doesn't lead to cell count problems. Initially, when you start doing it, maybe for the first couple of days, you can see a rise in cell count if you're looking at it. And maybe that'll be relevant, particularly in robots. It, it doesn't tie into a problem over the whole year. and doesn't. We don't associate it with a ha any higher in incidence of mastitis. But what we probably do is we probably look and say that the benefits from the cow putting on better condition and being in a better nutritional state and helping, let's say the example you gave of the lame cow, her getting over the lameness quicker, probably helps with reducing mastitis across the whole lactation. That'd be my view anyway. And I always tie this back into yos, that when we want to get yos in lamb, we flush them. That basically means we're putting in more energy than we're taking out. Whereas with dairy cows, we're trying to get the dairy cow from the time she calves, and we're trying to drive her on. And we want to maximize the use of grass, of course we do. But we're trying to drive her on, get plenty of milk out of her, have her comfortable and happy, 
and yet feed her in an economical way at the same time as we're trying to get her in calf. And there's lots of challenges associated with that. So I think that's that's something that we really need to look at. Yeah, I suppose as forward. well. Don't know, when it comes to that, you know, short period of time, you know, those six weeks, and you know, we're still in the middle of calf and we're talking about breeding. Um, I suppose you know it's getting those cows within you know over 42 days what is your opinion in terms of like when we get through this breeding season and cows are less than that 42 days you know what what's your your advice to people on that I suppose the first thing I'd be saying is we look at the whole herd and try and manage nutrition on that and then you look at the individual cow so set up a nutritional plan of what you're doing and what you're feeding the cows and that's like John you're doing that all the time without you do it every year without even really thinking about it but you make your plan what to do and if the weather turns bad even if the cows are out day and night when the weather turns bad you keep them in at night time or it's going to be a very wet night or maybe even you go out during the day if the weather turns really bad and you let them back in but then after that you need to look at your individual cows and address any problems well in advance of the breeding season so we've talked about the lameness any tin cows we want to do something with them Maybe they go on straw with the lame cows. Maybe they go to a closer paddock to make it easier on them. Maybe you look at scanning cows from a fertility point of view and pick out your problem cows. I personally don't believe there's a big merit in scanning every cow before the breeding season starts. But you pick out your cows that are going to be your problems. Anything that had milk fever, anything that held their cleanings, anything that had an LDA or an RDA, a hard calving, or just you might turn around and say, look, don't, I'm not happy with that cow. I don't really know why, but I'm not happy with her. We'll check her and then make a plan with them and try and have that done a couple of weeks before the breeding season starts. So she's cycling before the day you start at the end of April. I'd say, John, like it, it was a big challenge. Mm. And like when we were looking at 100 cows split autumn and spring calving, and you had roughly 60 cows in the spring, you know, you're kind of only talking maybe an average of two cows bulling a day and depending on the day there mightn't be any more than one cow bulling and a high yielding cow hard pick up like especially when they're still indoors yeah what would, and what would your protocol have been before you had heat detection collars well the autumn was a real challenge trying to catch them uh, in heat in the autumn time and i would always if i had 35 cows calved in the autumn i could end up synchronizing maybe 10 with, uh, on the program and uh, then in the, the spring less of a problem but it was tail painting and observation it was still time consuming then when you get on to the second round obviously the heats are less uh, they're less active on the heat so uh, the colors definitely you don't miss them if they show heat they, they pick them up yes yeah, so the challenges as well when you have if you have different people making it's, it's the responsibility of them to have to look at that tail paint too when I was in college, I worked on a, a big dairy farm up in Dublin, which was part of how I paid for college. And heat detection there, like it was a well-staffed farm, heat detection was half an hour, five times a day. And it wasn't tied in with milking, it was a separate individual person doing it, and we got very good results. But if I come out here to John and say, John, you should be looking at your cows half an hour, five times a day. John says, do you think I've nothing else to be doing? And then you have to go and look at the heifers. So, like, I think heat detection, in my own view, and like I've already talked enough about nutrition, in my own view, they're two of the biggest drivers on fertility in Irish dairy farms is good nutrition and good heat detection. I think the collars probably, there's no doubt the collars are a significant asset to that. And like you'd say, since you put them in, submission rates and conception rates yeah. have got better. Are you using sex semen? Uh, n not on cows, um, a small bit on cows, but yeah, on heifers I am using sex semen, yeah. Maybe the need for synchronising, particularly in heifers, is less depending on where the, the heifers are. But a lot of farmers have an out farm, and it's even a time of the year they're so busy. Synchronising is a very good management tool to get the heifers AI'd and get them out of the way. But just maybe points to be thinking of now to plan early. Certainly the biggest thing I'd be saying, if you're not doing your own AI, talk to the AI man and plan a day. Don't suddenly land it on him or her to the, I have 50 heifers to AI tomorrow morning and he already has a whole load of other jobs lined up. And like most spring cabin dairy farmers are all on the one, I suppose, week or 10 days that they want to get their heifers done. It's a very short window. And in advance of that as well, um, you're, you pre-scan some animals here, do you? 
Uh, not many, no, not many, because they would mostly they mostly would cycle. Uh, I, yeah, we yeah, wouldn't. Problem cows. Yeah, problem so cows. Problem cows. Only. And yeah. um, they're identified to you on Sense Hub, yes. is that right? Yeah. And do you want to just talk us through, I suppose, how you pick those out? And what well, I suppose anything an Easter cow that hasn't cycled in the last thirty days, uh, Sense Hub will pick them up and uh, you get a report with them on it, and I'll pick them out after milking and get uh, donuts. Uh, to scan them. Do you do that a number of times throughout the breeding season or just at the start? Yeah, maybe at the start or, or and, and maybe sometimes you will have a cow for whatever reason will cycle the first time pre-breeding and then not cycle after that and you might have to do a batch of them later on again. Okay. So Dola, you're scanning those and treating those accordingly? Yeah, and I suppose it depends on how many you have. So like if you have small numbers, doing them in one go makes sense. But it, it depends on the size of the herd and if you go to a very big herd, well, you're going to be doing that more often. Um, but like, it's great when you're scanning cows and John is there telling you she's calved 42 days and she hasn't been bullying or she has been bullying or, or she had a difficult calving. Like, the more information that you can give me at the time gives the better chance of what you're doing. And like, you're not only looking at the scanner as well, like, you're looking at the whole cow and what you can do. And We'd like to say that when we do scan cows and make a plan with them, that that goes a fair way towards getting them in calf. Sometimes I'd be personally disappointed. On the first heat after treatment, your conception rates and that can be quite low. But once you get them cycling, your conception rates on the next heat tend to be very good. So that's a hugely positive thing in it. There probably is a benefit maybe in scanning a little bit more during the breeding season that it might only be a couple of cows that there might be a half a concern of that we'll check. But also, we could scan a, a number of cows that are long enough in calf just to make sure that everything is going to okay, that they're in calf. Now is the time you want to be planning your bull, not halfway through June when you suddenly realise, I want the bull and where is he on? He's lame too. So we did talk about the cow, but the bull is important. So like the Hereford bull you use, that's all the only bull you have. That's the only bull, Happy yeah. with him? Very, yeah. Yeah, yeah, generally speaking, like they're easy calving, they're quiet, yeah, they're docile, and yeah. they're easy managed. Their feet tend to be quite good, but just they're the points to watch. Feet, he's fit and healthy, and probably worth getting his semen tested. And vaccinate him as well. I'd always do him. I I treat the bull the same as the cow when I'm vaccinating, and maybe get him fertility tested in advance of the breeding season, so he's ready to hit the ground running when you do need him. John, you previously mentioned that you uh, get distress alerts or you've seen distress alerts on your sense of system. Could you explain to us what you see or give us an example? Yeah, even well before you'd even see a sign of a, a sick cow, you'll get the, the alert. Uh, one morning last March, we're just coming towards the end of the silage pit and uh, we had, I had 18 alerts for cows in one morning and the rumination had just fallen off a cliff with all the cows had dropped, but there were 18 of them in distress and we put it down to mycotoxin poisoning towards the, just finishing off the, the silage pit. But uh, yeah, no, it picks it up all right. Picks it up quicker than, than, than I could pick it up. We've seen that as well on, on other farms. We've seen, like the example of the mycotoxins, we've seen that where rumination drops off. We've certainly seen it where bits of wire got into the silage or one example recently, chopped bales of straw to where we found there was bits of wire in it and it very quickly showed up a number of cows to were in distress and you wouldn't have picked them up without that or you wouldn't have picked them up at the same time. Another example I came out of, uh, there last year to the paddock open and sure the farmer in the middle of the night got a whole load of alerts as the cows were running down the, the lane right back into the yard so you know there, there's plenty of examples of that practical examples where it is useful. Yeah, and absolutely, I think as well, when you say, you know, 18 cows, I always think it's good, look to, good to look at the system and use those 18 as a representation of, of the rest of the herd too. Worth just, as you're turning cows out, sudden changes in diet are going to affect rumination. So like you want to gradually change from a, a, a TMR like John is or a silage diet, you don't suddenly stop silage today and day and night grass. Like we all know that, you have to gradually change whenever you're making. No, no use going from spud dinners to soup dinners. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to finish up here this evening, we're going to go through a couple of questions here that have come in from our listeners. So the first question is, how long do I need to have sense hub in advance of the breeding season? And do I need to have a sorting gate? So to, to answer the first part of that question, 
a sense of colors that need to be on the animals for seven days for heat to be picked up. You won't get your pre-breeding if, if they're not on for that, that any amount of time before that, but it needs to be seven days for heat. And I think maybe John, you might answer the question about the gate um, for sense of. Yeah, I suppose as far as I'd be concerned, it depends on the size of your herd. I've a relatively small herd and I know them very well. I, can, I have my own way of sorting them coming out of the parlor to a tie up area for AI. So I didn't go with the sorting gate. I was going to lose eight cubicles out of my shed as well. Um, and I was already tight for cubicles. So for that reason, I didn't go for the sorting gate. Definitely, I could see how it would have benefits all right, but just on balance, I decided not to go for it. Um, okay, second question here. What is best protocol for treating a dirty cow? So I'll give that one to you, Donna. Okay, I suppose, well, when you start thinking about what a dirty cow is, there's a whole load of variations on that. A, a certain amount of discharge coming from a, a calf bed or a uterus is normal after calving to a certain length of time after calving. So you're looking at what colour it is and a certain amount of white discharge up to maybe two to three weeks is normal enough. If you look then and say, if you have a cow that's dirty and smelly when you're milking a short while after calving, she's going to need treatment maybe with anti-inflammatory or maybe antibiotics or a washout. But I would say you need to talk to your, your vet about those. And di different ones of us are going to have different protocols on what we do with it. And then as you move on, you have endometritis. And maybe with endometritis, we're using products there that you're putting into the uterus in a similar way to what you'd be, as you'd be AI in a cow. And then maybe move on another step and we have maybe mo more severely sick cows of what we call a pyometra. And they maybe, they're going to require a more detailed treatment and maybe we'll be using hormones along with antibiotics and washouts to treat them and we get better success rates depending on what we apply to each cows but the big thing I'd say is if you have a cow that has metritis or is dirty or has held or cleanings discuss with your own vet get him or her out to treat them but more importantly come up with a protocol and myself and John here would have different protocols that we'd use depending on the different cows in some cases John will be doing it himself in other cases you might be talking to me on the phone and in other cases I might be out. Thanks very much for tuning in this evening. Our next video will be focused on tackling pneumonia and calves. All our videos will be available on agriland.ie. Thank you and good night.